And we're looking at 1 John chapter 4 this evening, and we're down to verse number 17. 1 John chapter 4, 17, for those joining us by way of technology, either now or later, we have our Bibles, those of us who are here, open to that passage. A lot in these verses, obviously, and we could spend more time than maybe we've spent on them, but hopefully we're getting the gist of what John is or was telling them and is telling us today. So... We pointed out that we could call 1 John 4 the blank chapter of the Bible. Love chapter. We could call John 1 John, or you could call it a lot of things, I guess, but you could call it the love chapter of the Bible. Along with 1 Corinthians 13 and Romans 12, John has a lot to say about love in these verses, love for one another. Something that ought to be natural for Christians, but doesn't hurt to be reminded of the need of truly loving one another. We're going to wrap up this section talking about verses 17 to 21 under the heading, A Life of Love. A Life of Love. And Adam, if you have that, read for us 17 through 21. 1 John 4, 17 to 21. (coughs) Herein is our law made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. All right, very good. Let's back up now to verse 17. John's been talking about several things about the love of God for us and look in those prior verses. And here he emphasizes again the concept and the need of love among Christians by saying herein is our love made perfect. How do we normally use the word perfect? Without any error. Without any error. Spotless, sinless, I mean, no flaws, no blemishes, whatever, just uh, absolutely perfect. Well, we understand that the word can be used that way, but here the word perfect simply means to be complete. You may have a translation that says complete or mature or whole. It's the same idea. None of us will ever be sinlessly perfect. And our love will not be perfect in that respect, but it can mature. And it can be whole. And that's the thrust of John here. So herein is our love made perfect, complete, whole, mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, boldness, some confuse the word boldness with brashness or arrogance. And some people are bold in that regard. But obviously that is not the word here. John will use the word boldness more than any other New Testament writer. If my count is correct, nine times in his gospel record and four times in 1 John. We've already looked at once in chapter 2, once in chapter 3. Here in chapter 4 and one more time in chapter 5, John uses the word boldness. Now we're told that the original word meant when you were in a public assembly, you had the freedom to speak openly. You didn't hold back your words. You weren't shy. You weren't afraid to speak. That was how the word was used, in in boldness. Now, obviously in certain situations, if you lived under certain regimes, you would be very careful. You would choose your words very carefully and wouldn't be as bold. But that's not the, the concept here. It means confidence. It means freedom of speech. It does not mean arrogance or brazenness or brashness. The idea is that since God loves us and we have fellowship with God and we remain in him and he lives in us, therefore, we can have confidence in the day of judgment. Confident that we will hear Jesus say to us those cherished words, well done. Our good and faithful servant. Those are the words we long to hear. God forbid we hear, depart from me. Those will be awful words, and the majority will hear those words. But we want to 
we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And some will hear those words, well done. Everybody's not going to be lost. We don't want to leave the impression that everybody's going to be lost. That's simply not the case. The majority will, but we want to be in the minority when it comes to the day of judgment. Look back at chapter 2, 28, 1 John 2, 28. Again, we're talking about confidence. We're talking about boldness here in the day of judgment. 1 John 2, 28, John says, Now little children, abide or remain in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. There's our word boldness, confidence. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. The Bible is forthright. It tells us the day of judgment is coming. We do not know when, and we turn a deaf ear to people who think they do know when, and set dates and so forth. We know it's coming. We simply do not know the date, hour, or the time. But God knows the when of that. We know the fact of it. Now, for most people, this day of judgment, contemplating the day of judgment, for a lot of people, they just deny it. They put it out of their mind. They don't believe it to begin with. For others, it is a day of fear. For people who believe in the Bible but know their lives are not what they ought to be, for them, it is a day of fear. They dread that day. But for the faithful, John's talking about here, and hopefully that includes us, it is not a day of fear, it is a day to look forward to. You may remember when Paul was about to die, he said, I am ready. I'm ready. And it's great if we can live, if today is our last day, we, like Paul, can say, I'm ready. Ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. Fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. So Paul said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Love his appearing. Paul was ready to die. He was ready for judgment. And we were often taught in school, whenever it came time for a test, if you will study a little bit every day, then when test day comes, you can't wait for test day. You are ready. If you'll just study a little bit every day. Guess who did that? I didn't. <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't take that advice, and so I feared test day. I wasn't ready for test day. You stayed up the night before cramming. It would have been a whole lot easier if you just studied a little bit every day. Then you're ready. Well, that's the way we want to live as God's people. We want to, to live for the Lord every day, every day. And therefore, we can have confidence in the day of judgment, not because we've earned heaven. We don't earn heaven. If we go to heaven, it'll be by the grace of God and our response to his grace. But John says we can have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, who's the he? The Lord, Jesus, exactly right. I like the New King James Version here because they capitalize pronouns referring to Jesus, and, and uh, I, I like that. I'm using the King James. There's nothing, nothing wrong, capital, not capital, but sometimes it helps us identify who's the he. And so this is the last, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Peter tells us that Jesus is our example that we should follow his steps. Jesus is the perfect pattern. If I pattern my life after Jesus, I'm not going to go wrong. And I'll be ready for the judgment whenever it is come. If I follow a pattern and the pattern is perfect, then I'm going to be fine. If somebody's building a house, they follow a set of plans called what? Blueprint. And if those building the house, if the blueprint is right, 
and the fellows building the house follow a blueprint to a T, what about the house? It's going to be right. It's going to be right, isn't it? I went by Burger King yesterday morning for a bite of breakfast, and some of the bricks had fallen off the wall as I went through the drive through and I got to looking, and the, the wall was, the wall that was, the bricks were standing was just wavy. You could see where the wall was buckling out. And I came up and asked the young lady, what on earth, you know, if somebody run into the building, what on earth is happening? She said, well, she said, I, I guess you know what she's talking about, said the foundation is shifting. And those bricks are just falling off the, off the building there. So next time I'll pull a little bit further away <laughs> from the building, I think at the drive through Hopefully they'll get that fixed. Somebody probably goofed up when, whenever the, uh, the, the foundation may have been poured, if, if she's right about that. But if you follow the blueprint, the blueprint prints right, then you'll be right. If you're, if you're making a cake and you're following a recipe and the recipe's right, your cake's going to be right. But if you add a pinch of this and leave out a dab of that, then who knows how the cake's going to be. Jesus is our perfect pattern. If we follow him, we're not going to go wrong. That's what John is saying. As he is, so are we in this world. And if we are, then verse 18 naturally follows. There is no fear in love. The word fear is used in the Bible is used different ways. We use the word fear different, differently today, different ways. The same word has different meanings. We talked about the word love before. The word fear can mean reverence and respect. And it's often used toward whom? Toward God. We're to have fear, that kind of fear of God. Another usage of fear, though, means to be frightened, to be alarmed. We are fast approaching Halloween. Sunday, in fact. I don't know, maybe kids will celebrate it Saturday night, I don't know, but it's a time of fear. Television movies, the advertising movies, the, the, the Halloween theme, and TV shows, the Halloween theme, and so forth. And there's a lot of fear. Or it's all in fun, obviously, but for younger kids it can be a time of, of fear. That is the word here. This, the word fear here means to be frightened, and then some. We get our English word phobia. Well, I may have talked about this Sunday or last week. We get our English word phobia from this word in the original. And so the word phobia means fear. If you are claustrophobic, what are you afraid of? Closets, right? Claustrophobia. Well, that's, that's really not what claustro means, but it means tight places. Uh, hydrophobia. Hydro. What is hydro? Water. water. Fear of water. Some people are afraid, afraid of water. Acrophobia. Fear of height. And on and on the phobias go. The word phobia means fear. And that is the word that is the word here. John says, some things in life just don't mix. Oil and water don't mix, do they? I mean, you cannot mix oil and water. John says, love and fear don't mix. They simply don't mix. There is no fear in love. If my life is right, if my faith is right, if my love is right, and I know we're saying a lot of ifs there, then there is no fear in love. We are human beings. And I think there is an innate, built-in type of, Maybe not using the word fear, but at least respect for certain things. We certainly have a respect for death, don't we? That's why we try to take care of ourselves. We try to drive right. We try to treat others right. Hopefully we'll be treated right. There's an innate human built in, even within animal life, there's a, a built in uh, type of maybe not fear, but dread or respect at least for certain things. And so I don't know that John is... is, is Xing that out. But at the same time, the child of God ought not get up every day absolutely worried half to death. I mean, there's something wrong with my faith 
If I, I get up and tremble all day long, just afraid of this, afraid of that, afraid of my own shadow, there's something wrong with my faith. My faith shouldn't be in Wayne. Where should it be? It should be in God. He's my Father. He's all-powerful. He made me. He sustains me. He'll save me. So while there's a, a bit of natural, innate, a little bit of fear of that sense, I don't need to be living my life just, again, afraid of my own shadow. Because that indicates a lack of love, obviously, and a lack of, of faith. John says that perfect, mature love. Nobody has spotless, flawless love. Mature love, complete love, does away with fear. Cast out fear because fear has torment. There are folks who get up in the day... And they just torment themselves over what might happen. Over what might happen in the course of a day. And that ought really not be a, true of, of a child of God. When my two sisters and I were growing up, dad and mom worked. Dad was a mechanic and mom worked at the pajama factory. We rode the bus home, school bus home. And so we rode the bus home. Bus didn't come down our road. He let us off, and we walked about 20 miles. Uh, seemed like 20 miles. I think maybe half a mile. Blinding snow, sandstorms, all that. But uh, being a little facetious there, obviously. But there were times when we when we came home, we were alone. Now Janice, she was she would have been, uh, I don't know. She's five years older than me. she's old enough to look after us. Is the idea? It was her and me and my younger sister, and we were all alone. Home alone. There were days that we dreaded when dad and mom came home. You know why, don't you? Well, we either broke something, or we got in a fight, got scratched up, or did something we ought not to have done, and so we dreaded, we feared them coming home because we knew we were in trouble then. Now, we vowed secrecy. I'm by nature a quiet person. I would never tell on my sisters. <laughs> well, that's another story too. But anyway, we, 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 dread, we dreaded them coming home because we had done wrong. A lot of folks dread going to the dentist. I don't, it's not my cup of tea, but there are some folks who will torment themselves. They're going to make it a lot worse by dreading it. Nine times out of ten, than the actual procedure. You think about how the unsaved, some at least, torment themselves thinking about judgment. I think some people are so seared, they're, they're, they're beyond feeling. It doesn't seem to bother them. But you think about people who are acquainted with the Bible. You think about people who we call them backsliders, who were taught better but aren't living right. You know every once in a while that has to pop up in their mind. If I died right now and I face God in judgment, that has to scare them, not scare them to death, but sad to say it doesn't scare them enough to what? Do something about it. <laughs> and some people are scared of the judgment, but not scared enough to do something about it. Fear has torment. Where there is disobedience, there is fear. Who was the first couple? Adam and Eve. I mean, things were floating along fine there at first. They're in the Garden of Eden just enjoying being with God, enjoying the garden and all the, the beauty of that and the sinless state. And then one day God called out, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid myself. What did he say next? Because I was afraid. Why was he afraid? Well, among other reasons, he did what God told him not to do. Disobedience brings fear. I didn't have to worry about dad and mom coming home if I didn't disobey. Disobedience brings fear. Romans, the eighth chapter, we talked about that, so we won't go there now, but... Paul, at the end of Romans 8, asked the question, who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
And he just gave a list of things. Life, death, principalities, powers, things present, things to come. And in essence, Paul said there is absolutely nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Unless old Wayne decides to separate himself. That's, that's the crux of the matter. So, we want to love one another. We want to love God. We want our love to mature. The more our love matures, the less fear we have in our lives. In verse 19, we love him. And the him would be God. I'd put a capital H there. We love him because capital H, he first loved us. I can't say... I love God before he loved me because God was before I ever was, before I was even a thought. God has always been. So he first loved me, and then it's up to me to love him back. Okay? Again, one of the definitions of God is God is love. We love him because he first loved us. And if I'm not faithful to God, I can sum up my problem with four words. I don't love God. If I'm not faithful to God, the reason is I don't love him. That's what John is saying. We love him because he first loved us. But again, our love has to go beyond loving God. If a man say 20, I love God and hate his brother, hates his brother. And again, these are strong terms, aren't they? Nobody likes being called a liar. It's not a compliment to be called such. If a man says, I love God, but I hate my brother, John says, God says through John, I am a liar. The Gnostics of the day claimed they loved God, but they hated Christians. They lied. The scribes and Pharisees of the day, they claimed to love God, didn't they? But they hated the Lord and his followers, so they lied. And on down the list we we can go. False teachers in the church and out of the church profess that they love God. And yet they spew their venom toward teachers of the truth. And we want, of course, to look at ourselves as well. He, if a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. My attitude toward my brother is not right. Then my attitude toward whom is not right? God. Okay, if my attitude toward my brother is not right, then my attitude toward God is not right. I can pray, I can sing loud and long, I can have my Bible open and so forth, but if I don't love my brother, then I have some serious, serious issues. Sometimes churches form, for this very reason, a lack of love. Sometimes churches form because of missionary work, and that's a good thing. But sometimes churches form because Christians don't get along with each other. And that is never, ever a good thing. I like this illustration. I may have told it before. It's, it's sort of long, but it sort of illustrates, you know, whenever people don't get along, sometimes they just, instead of working things out, form another church. About a man who was stranded on a desert island. He was there a long time, many, many years. One day, walking down the beach, he saw a ship in the distance, and I mean, he just got all over himself. Salvation. And so he built a fire, created smoke, wanted the ship to see the smoke. And lo and behold, it did. And they sent a dinghy from the big ship, couldn't pull right up the beach, obviously, a small boat to this individual, and I mean, he just hugged these fellows who came to rescue him and just was overjoyed about all of that. And, of course, they asked him, how on earth did you survive all these years on this island all by yourself? And he just told them how he foraged for food and became adept at at hunting and fishing and so forth. In fact, he said he, he built him a fine house to live in. And he pointed up to the hill and said, there's my house. And they were amazed. And they saw two other buildings close to his house. And they said, you know, what's that building there right next to your house? He said, that's where I go to church. He said, well, 
What's the other building? That's where I used to go to church. <laughs> he couldn't get along with himself. <laughs> and so he left one church and went to another. That's sort of funny, sort of sad, sort of true. But again, it underscores the importance of loving our brother. John says, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Usually, it is easier to love what we see, correct? Usually, now there are exceptions, but usually it is easier to love what we see. If I fail in loving the easier, then I'm really going to struggle with loving that which isn't as easy, what John is saying. If I don't love my brother and I can see him, I mean, he's right here before me, how can I love God I haven't even seen? I haven't even seen God. Of course, the answer is I can't. And so 21, this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. Any thoughts from you as we wrap up chapter 4? That's what I was going to say. We sure don't deserve. Good point. Like the father of who? We'll stand there with open arms. Prodigal son. Prodigal son. Love of a father for a wayward son. Love of God for a wayward people. Never give up. If you think about what he said in verse 19 about, you know, with fear. Um, you think about like you know a child grows up learning to do right from wrong i think in a lot of respects out of fear of not getting punished but there comes a time which i know we've all experienced that where you stop doing what you're you you know you stop doing what your parents tell you out of fear but you start but instead you start doing it because you love them um, and that's because love is a more powerful motivating uh, you know, element than what fear is. Because right. if you think about Christians there in the first century that are dealing with persecution, you know, it can be very easy for the fear of immediate punishment for being a Christian to outweigh the fear of being lost eternally. But love is a completely, uh, is a more powerful motive to do something. And that's what, that's right. what God is saying. If you're motivated by love, it doesn't matter what you face, the the motivation of love is going to overcome whatever you fear. Outweigh fear. Yeah, yeah. It, it outweighs. Very good. Very good. I think we can see why we could call First John 4 at least a love chapter of, of the Bible. Okay. Any other? Let's look at chapter 5 then. We'll at least start chapter 5. We've got a, we've got a few, few minutes left. I'm going to Reset that clock. Eventually, it's, it's running slow, so don't let me, don't let me keep you here all night. But we'll uh, co co cover a couple of verses in chapter five. Uh, there are a lot of things in chapter five. You might say that chapter five is sort of a catch-all chapter. John talks about a lot of different things, but one of which is he begins by talking about joyful obedience, and that sort of goes ties in with what Adam said there a moment a moment ago. So, Adam, if you will, let, let's. Look at verses 1 to 3 at least uh, to begin this section. Uh, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Uh, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. grievous. So we see in chapter 5 that the theme of love continues. We know that the Bible 
originally there were no chapter verse divisions, so sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes, you know, he's really not beginning a new thought in, in chapter 5 is, is my point. Verse 21 of chapter 4, if you love God, you love your brother, which might raise the question, well, who is my brother? And that's what this section answers. Who is my brother? One came to Jesus on one occasion and asked him the question, who is my neighbor? And that answer is everybody is your neighbor. But now who is my brother is a different answer to that, isn't it? We would want everybody to be our brother and we're all related in that and we know that. But spiritually speaking, that's a different matter. Everybody is not born of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. How might some abuse that verse to teach what? All you've got to do, all you've got to do to be saved, to be born of God is belief. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. End of discussion, some would say. Close your Bible, put your pen down. That's all you have to do. If that were the only verse in the Bible, what? We would agree. We would say amen to that. But John didn't stop in verse 1. He's going to go on down and say more about this being born of God. In fact, in the word Bible, the word faith in the Bible is always conjoined with obedience. Faith and obedience. By faith, Moses did something. By faith, Abraham did something. If we have faith, we do. We act. So whoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that beget, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Just repeating the theme of loving your brother. By this, verse 2, we know that we love the children of God, when we love God, but John didn't stop there, did he? And keep his commandments. Here's how we know we love God. Here's how we know we love the children of God. Whenever we, by faith and love, do what God wants us to do. <laughs> to do. Verse 3, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So it's not just well-intentioned words or good speech, but action. In other words, I want you to demonstrate your love. Don't say it. Don't just say it. Make sure you demonstrate it. Somebody's pointed out that everything in creation except man obeys God. Everything in creation except man obeys God. The psalmist says fire and Snow and hail and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Psalm 148, verse 8. You think about Jonah. The wind obeyed God. The waves obeyed God. The great whale obeyed God. What about Jonah? He didn't. <laughs> All the elements of nature obeyed God. Here was a prophet of God who said no, at least initially. And ran away from God. Even the, even the gourd or the plant that God gave to shield Jonah from the sun. And that little worm that killed the plant. Even those creatures or that vegetation obeyed God. But Jonah was very reluctant to do so. So this is the love of God. Here's how we prove that we love God. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Anybody have a different rendering of the word grievous? Burdensome, B-U-R-D-E-N-S-O-M. -E Some leave off the sum and just say burden. God's commandments are not a burden. Think about a burden, you think of something heavy, don't you? Something that's distasteful, something you don't like. Now, some commandments in life are a burden. I mean, just, just face it. When you were told to take out the trash, I don't know anybody in his right mind that just gets a thrill out of taking out the trash. <laughs> Is there any joy in taking out the, you know it has to be done, but it has to be done and you do it, but that's sort of a drag, you know, for a kid to take out the trash or mow the yard or wash the dishes. 
Some commands are, some would view them at least as a burden. I mean, there's no joy in that. It just has to be done. And again, we have to think about motive, our motive, and so forth. But if I truly love God, then what God tells me to do is not a drag. It is not heavy. It is not a burden. You think about the scribes and Pharisees. They placed a lot of unnecessary demands upon people. And they added to God's law hundreds of man-made rules in addition to God's laws. Some that were outlandish. And they were burdensome. Like how you wash your hands. The water had to drip off the elbow in just a, a certain way according to them and their rules. You could not heal a man on the Sabbath, no matter how sick he was. But you could help an animal on the Sabbath. That would be a burdensome rule. You could not go in the field, no matter how hungry you were, and take grain and eat it, because in taking grain you were combining or harvesting, and in putting the grain from your hand to the mouth you were carrying a load. The Bible taught no such nonsense. Those were burdensome commands they had added to the will of God. But whenever I look at my Bible and I see the things that God wants me to do, and if I have problems doing those things, whether it's visiting or attending or reading or whatever, if I ask, do I have to do these things, then I'm already, I've already set myself up for problems, haven't I? Do I have to? Well, I should say I want to, correct? If my love for God is right, it's not a matter of have to. It's a matter of want to. Because the motive, again, is, is love. And so his commandments are not a burden. Not a burden. The longest chapter in the Bible is what chapter, by the way? What is the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119. Every verse but two refers to the Word of God. Every verse but two of the 176 verses in Psalm 119 refer to the Word of God. And the psalmist over and over talks about rejoicing in and loving and delighting. He said that the Word of God was honey to his taste. He loved his Lord and he loved his law. And the, the key ingredient is, is love. If, if we truly love God, everything falls into place. What fellow had to work so many years for his wife? Remember the Old Testament? Fellow had to work so many years for his wife? Jacob. The Bible says all those years were what? Just a few days. Why? What turned all those years of hard work in just a few days? What made the difference? Because of the love he had for Rachel. When love is the motive, we don't have any problem doing what the Lord wants us to do. We are out of time, a good stopping place. So we will pick up, Lord willing, next Wednesday, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4. 1 John 5, verse 4.